are continuing our series on how to build your faith. And we can't have that series if we don't talk about how to study your Bible. Do you know that in this room, plus or minus, about 30% of you read your Bible once a week? 30%. That's what research and statistics say, which is, is kind of scary because we know that there's really no greater way to get to know God, his character, his nature, his goodness, or to understand the plan for our lives and what God has in store for us by reading his word. Remember last week, remember what the topic was? Anyone? How to? Oh, that was one before. Anyone remember? Because we're going back. All right. Just throw the other one up. We're going back. I'm kidding. Don't, you don't have to do that. How to hear God, basically. Lord, speak to me. One of the best ways that we can hear God speak is through his word, though. So we ha this has to be the, the natural thing. Christians who are engaged in scripture most days, and I'm going to tell you that the, the number is 57% of your week. If you read scripture 57% 50 of your week, four days, you have the odds of lowering or participating in these behaviors. Getting drunk, 57% lower. Sex outside marriage, 68% lower. Use of pornography, 61% lower. Gambling, 74% lower. Pretty amazing. That's just by four days. And some of you read it every day. So those numbers continue to change. But you can see how this will change you if you understand how to read and how to study God's word. I read this, and it says, the individual believer is weakened... And the Christian community as a whole is weakened when we don't read the word. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. I do. Yes. It makes sense. So if the Bible is so, if it's so important, we know that it can change behaviors just by reading it. Why do we struggle to read it? Why do we struggle and why do we get frustrated to read God's word? Do you know what the biggest problem is? Most of us really, really want to, but we don't know how. We don't know how. We don't know where to start. If I'm reading this book here, this is a John Maxwell book. If I'm going to read this book, where am I going to start? I'm going to start in the beginning. So what do we do with the Bible? We start in the beginning. Genesis. Exodus. Oh, I love some Exodus. And then, oh, can we be honest? Leviticus. That's a, that's a Bible reading plan killer. That right there is seen if you have grit. Because we read books from start to cover, but this isn't just a book. This is God's story. Leviticus. So we start in the beginning, and then we get frustrated sometimes. And if you make it through Leviticus, guess what's next? Oh, just like it sounds. There's no tricks there. So a lot of times we don't make it through Leviticus in numbers. So that's a problem. So we just kind of quit. Because if that's your first taste of God's word, I'm going to be honest with you, it started really good and then it got boring like a lot of other books that I've read. So if we start there, that's one way. The other way is kind of like this. Have you ever done this, you spiritual people? <laughs> Shake it like a magic eight ball. <laughs> God, what do you want to tell me today? There it is. Have you ever done that? People start like that. They start reading programs like that. It's kind of called the lucky dip method. Although often it's, very, it's not very lucky because there's scriptures in the Bible that are just really weird. And if you're asking God for guidance and you do the, the magic eight ball or the lucky dip, you could come into something like, you'd read something like this. 
Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. That's in there. That's in Psalms. Or even better yet, and you shall eat it as barley cake. Some of you know where I'm going with this. Baking it in their sight on human dung. That's why that method doesn't work. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. But those scriptures are in there. And some people don't know where to start, so they start in places that are just crazy. But that's not the best way to learn. And we want to study God's word to learn about God and learn what God has in store for us. So to do that, we need to be somewhat systematic. It's okay to be systematic, even though some of us really want to be led by the Spirit, I still think you need to have systematic Bible reading in your lives. Because, you know, what I find is I tend to go to certain books that I really like. Books, some books are easier. Let's just be serious. James. I love James. But if we want to study it, if you want to start, start with Philemon. Short book. We're going to talk about it a little bit. How many chapters is it? One. One chapter long. Because the Word of God is exciting in that one chapter. We see that it's powerful, that it can speak to us in one chapter. We understand that the Word protects us with those statistics that I gave us, that it empowers us, that it helps us, that it guides us, that it instructs us, that it teaches us in, in doctrine, what we should believe, what we should follow. And it shows us what God has in store for us. It shows us the truth. And Scripture says that the truth will actually set you free. So we don't want to miss out on God by not reading His Word. So great, this next slide is really what you need to remember. I'm going to talk more, but this is what you need to remember. These are the points. The first thing you need to do is you need to choose a translation that you understand. I like ESV, NIV, NLT. I study out of the New King James a lot of times, but I don't speak to you out of New King James because some of it's a little confusing. Translations continue to come out and they continue to evolve. So the first thing we want to do is choose a translation. Then you want to choose a time and a place. Set aside some time to study. You don't need to do marathon studies. Set some time and study. Understand the context. It matters. Context matters. Read slowly. Ask questions. You can question. You can ask questions about the Word. And then pray for God to speak to you and apply what He shows you. If you do that, I guarantee in one month you'll be a different person. That You will be changed. But let's go back to choosing a translation. You need to choose a translation that you understand. I have a scripture I want to read for you out of two different translations. This is Philemon 1, 7 and 8. King James, so hold on. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love. That sounds really good. Because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. I've never said that to any of you. <laughs> I will never say that to any of you. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. That's a lot. That's a sentence. Or, your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I'm asking boldly, or excuse me, I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it as in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. Those are a little different, right? It matters. Because in King James, when it was written, the bowels was kind of how people felt. 
It was their gut. It was their insides. But if you tell someone, you know, I have a scripture for you today, and your scripture is, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. You're not thinking bowels like he's writing bowels. Is that true? Okay, I'm not going to pick on that anymore. There's a lot of material there, but I'm, I'm going to not use it. Scripture was written in three different languages. It's been translated to a lot of different languages, and it's not always an equal translation. That's why we need to study a little bit more. Like if you go on the YouVersion app, and I don't, how many of you use YouVersion? It's also called, it's kind of confusing because on your phone, it's called the Bible, but it's actually YouVersion. How many of you use that? Can you just raise your hands? All right, my notes are on there. Are like our church has a, uh, something on there, but you can, if you look under events, you can find. It's not today? <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, last week should be up there, so you didn't know those anyway, so you could go back, and then I'll put the other ones up this week. Pastor Josh can make that happen, though. Um, I'm not sure why they're not up, but, but most of the time, if I click the right buttons, my notes are up. They will be up later. But there's like 3,000 different translations that you can pick. I do think you should use a paper Bible, too. Because you like to write in it, you like to memorize it. You know what I found with YouVersion and other Bible apps that are on my phone? They all look the same in my head, right? It all looks the same. It all looks like a computer screen. And it may totally be my age. I understand that. However, when I study any book, I like to, I see things. And that's how it works for me. All right, so next thing. You need to choose a time and a place to study, just like you do everything. Because consistency matters. You want to be consistent. And this is the heart, maybe the hardest thing of everything, is trying to find a consistent time in your life where you can study. I'm not going to tell you that you need to get up at 5 a.m. and study. You study when it works with your life. Some of you have really good routines in the morning. Some of you are not morning people. So that's the last thing you want to do is do anything in the morning you might do better at night. But do it when you can actually absorb the information. You can do this with a paper, a pen. You can do it digitally. You can do it through a book. You can do it through a plan. There's so many different ways that you can study God's Word. The next thing is that we need to understand the context. Now, this is important on, on multiple levels. But have you ever walked into a conversation and there was a conversation going on and you had no idea what was going on and you didn't know the context and then you tried to jump in and you were not even talking about the same topic? That's what it's like if we don't understand the context. We have to be careful with that. Context matters. It matters more than we can imagine and sometimes more than we can understand because the Bible, it's, it's a library more than it is a book, if I can say that. It's, it's a library. It's a lot of things put together. It's a collection of 66 different books written in three languages across three continents over a 1,500-year time period by 40 different authors. Do you think the context is going to be a little bit different? It is. I'm not even talking about when you open the Bible up and I open the Bible up. We are reading it through the lens of life. Your mood matters. How you were raised matters. Your, your cognitive biases. All those things matter when we read the Word of God and what we hear and what we see. So we have to filter that out. But this is a collection of prophecies and letters and laws and poetry and life that shows us how God wants to interact with us. And that's why context matters. And to study it, to understand context, we want to know who it was written, why it was written, who wrote it, what was the purpose. Certain books have different purposes. They're very simple. 
A lot of the letters are Paul writing for encouragement, for discipline. The one we're going to spend some time in later today, he's basically asking his friend to be nice to the slave that ran away and show God's mercy on this now brother in Christ. That's the simplicity of the letter. So if we start with that context in Philemon, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear brother and fellow worker, and to the church that meets in your home. Wow, right there, that's a lot of context that he just gave us. First thing is that he says that Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon. Now, Paul often said, I'm an apostle, but not here he didn't, depending on the translation that you read. But this is a very, very short letter because it didn't need to be long. Paul's saying, I'm a prisoner of Christ. Usually I'm an apostle, but I want to reach to you as a brother more than an authority in this letter. We get that right away. So the context matters. He's not pulling any rank in this letter. Sometimes he does pull rank because he needed more discipline. No rank here. He's speaking friendship here. It was written by Paul. He was in prison when he wrote this. We know that. And Philemon was a wealthy person that he wrote this to. And he had a church in his home. So all of that we know is part of the context, right? And it was written about one person, Onesimus, who was a slave that ran away somewhere while he ran away, he ran into Paul. And what do you think that conversation went like? It's like, you need Jesus. And he comes to find Christ. So Paul writes this letter and he gives it back to him. And he says, in the letter we, we read, he's like, I'm going to send the letter with Onesimus. He's going to bring it back to you. So please show grace and mercy, basically what he's saying. But the purpose of this was really to encourage Philemon to forgive and to show mercy because that wasn't the normal thing that would happen during the day. If a, if a slave, and there's way different ways that slaves serve in the context of Scripture, but if a slave ran away... When they came back, there would be punishment. And that punishment could be severe as death. It could be beatings. It could be branding. There was a lot of different things that could happen. But, but what Paul's saying in this letter, in the context matters so much, he's like, hey, can you just forgive him because he's a brother in Christ? He says, I know that he stole from me who he escaped, but can you, can you forgive him and can you treat this slave as your equal as a brother in Christ. Verse 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. It's so loving. Isn't that, that, that tone is way different than some of Paul's other writings but it's just so loving. I know that you're doing what's right. Now that we know the context, we read slowly and we ask questions. So that's the next thing. So when you read scripture, what does this say about God? What is it saying about God? And what does this say to me? What does this say to me? Remember a few weeks ago when I had something that was like a two by four and I had it in my hand? And we said that was like the speck in, in, in your eye and then this two by four in my eye. And Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. This is how we get the two by four out of our eye and we, we understand our blind spots by, by Scripture. Because that's how God will speak to you and say, hey, maybe you need to show mercy and forgiveness to someone in your life. Just like Paul's writing here. Now write this or type this in your Bible. If, oh, actually, you can't. It's, not on, it's in the notes. All right. <laughs> Questions that you need to ask. Is there sin to be avoided? 
Is there a promise to be claimed? Is there an example to follow? Is there a command to obey? Is there something to know about God? A lot of times when we're reading, we don't know what to do. We don't know what questions to ask. Those right there are great questions. Those are much better questions than some of the stuff that we can come up with when our mind starts to wander, right? So if you stick to those, you'll have a pattern and a path. All right, so we are at choose a translation that you understand, choose a time and a place, understand the context, Read slowly and ask questions. And these are great starting questions. And the last thing is this. Pray for God to speak to you and apply what he shows you. Sit down and say, God, what, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to see here? God, speak to me. Speak to me. Show me. Verse 8, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold in an order to do what ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in change. chains. Excuse me. And we see that in this, this little piece here, that there's this change from slave to son. Some translations say, Paul writes that he is his son because he, he brought him into the family of God. So when we go deeper and we look at some of the original languages, some of these words mean different things, and some of you love the deep study. Keep it up. Keep it up. Keep up the deep study. It's great. There's buried treasure. There's Easter eggs all over in Scripture. A lot of times we don't do deep study on a Sunday morning because that's not where it happens. It happens on Wednesday nights. It happens in your quiet times. It happens in Bible studies. When we look at verse 11, formerly Onesimus was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Do you see how that can apply to you? That at one point, when you were dead in your sins, you were something. And then when you met Christ on the road, then you changed into something totally different. Now, he's saying useless. I'm not going to say you were useless. That's still a little Paul harsh, right? Onesimus means useful. Play on words there twice in Scripture. But he's saying you, you went from useless to useful. But you can't have a but now if you didn't have a formally even in your life. You can't have a but now if you didn't have a past is what I'm saying. You see, sometimes we need to ask, instead of asking God why when we study, we need to ask him what. What, what, what are you speaking to me here, God? Think back though in your life how has God used circumstances that you really didn't want? Or you look back now and they were just bad decisions to actually be useful and used for good because he was involved in that picture. When we read scripture, part of what's going on is God is writing your story as you read his story. And that's amazing. If you just sit back and think about that for, for just a little bit, the fact that God is writing a story with you that's better than the story without him. And he's inviting us in. But if we're not, if we're not spending some time reading his word, if we're just coming up and, you know, we're just showing up once in a while, doing our thing and just, just doing the magic eight ball or, or just playing around in the word, not systematic, it's really hard to learn. I've found over the years that when, when I hire people, full-time employees actually tend to work out and learn way better than someone who's casual or part-time. Makes sense. They're there more. They're there consistently. And there's nothing wrong with part-time employees or even casual. But it takes them, if they're there once a week, it takes them five times as long to learn that job. 
If there are twice, it just, it just does. So if we do that with this, if we take that same principle and we put it to the Word of God, if I'm only in it once a week instead of five, six, seven, eight times a week, seven times a week, sorry, it's going to make a difference. Because then we'll say, you know what, I was, I was formerly sick, but now I've been healed. I was formerly addicted, but now I'm becoming sober, I'm becoming clean, because there's that change with Christ. I was formerly depressed, and I was anxious, but now I have peace because of Jesus. Formerly, before, my marriage was a mess. But now we're seeking God together. Formerly, I was lost, but now I'm found. Some of you have been waiting for God to rewrite your story. I'll tell you when that happens. When you read and obey his word. That's what needs to happen. Because it's really hard to have your story match his if you don't know what his story is, unless you're just getting what I give you. And that's not quite enough. But we have to remember that the Word of God is alive and it's active and it's powerful. It will speak to you. It will guide you. It will change you if you let it and if you spend time in the Word of God. It's a love story. It's a rescue story. It's a creation story. It's a new creation story. And God wants to invite us into it.